Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, nice uh, to be uh, with you all uh, online, electronically this time. Um, so what I want to share with you uh, briefly today is uh, some activity that we have been involved with, with characterizing instruments for using onboard UAVs. Um, just to start very quickly with that, I mean, the main motivation is that, uh, like, if you think about field campaigns uh, using manned aircraft, uh, we have been involved in a few uh, uh, over the past years. Uh, you can get really beautiful results. Basically, you can get nice vertical profiles of different uh, aerosol parameters. This is a flight that we conducted in over the Aegean Sea in many locations. So we flew from, uh, from Crete. Uh, we went all the way up to the North Aegean and along the way, the, the plane did a few dives and collected data on the composition of, uh, of uh, the aerosol particles, which we then converted to uh, uh, the hygroscopicity parameter of the par particles, which is this kappa shown here. Um, and now all this information is, is extremely useful for uh, modelers, especially climate modelers, that we, they want to feed their models with some parameters of the aerosol so that can, they can predict uh, the uh, impacts of particles on, on climate and so on and so forth. So these type of vertical profiles are extremely useful uh, for this community atmospheric sciences community. Now, the issue here is that if you want to fly one of these aircrafts, as you can imagine, uh, uh, the cost is extremely high. Um, we are talking about several thousands of euros per hour of, uh, of this aircraft. And this is the main reason uh, why we have, uh, that we have invested in, in the Institute in Cyprus, the Cyprus Institute on developing a laboratory that is equipped with, uh, with UAVs that can do more or less the, the same job, um, but in a much more cost-effective way. Um, in fact, uh, now the lab is quite big. It consists of a few engineers and pilots that can fly these UAVs. So it's not people like uh, you and me that can easily fly. We are talking about uh, airline uh, uh, pilots that uh, have to fly and give a note to the uh, local authorities so that they know that the UAV is there. Um, we have also um, got a number of UAVs, uh, uh, fixed wing and, and, uh, and multi-copters, and the payload varies uh, anywhere from one to 15 kilograms. And the endurance uh, also varies from eight minutes up to four hours. So depending on the mission and uh, what you're after, uh, when someone is after, we can uh, deploy a different aircraft. Uh, the most important element uh, of this facility <coughs> is the airspace. <coughs> uh, here in Cyprus, we have got uh, permanent permission for an airspace that is uh, more or less five by five kilometers. Uh, uh, and then uh, we can fly anytime we want uh, up to an altitude of two or maybe three kilometers without any additional permission. And that makes a big difference, especially when you have to uh, uh, mount instruments, uh, more, more, mostly if you have to develop the instruments and mount them and test them. You cannot wait for authorization uh, uh, to get granted. You can immediately go to the ESR field and, and fly the, uh, the system. Now, uh, adjacent to this lab, um, we have the instrumentation lab. And uh, of course, in order not to waste time of the pilots and the, 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 the UAV uh, uh, laboratory, we test the instruments uh, 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 at the conditions that they would be exposed to when they fly with these UAVs. You have to keep in mind that uh, these UAVs do not have a, a, a pressure or temperature controlled cabin. So the instruments are exposed to the conditions that they experience uh, uh, up to the altitudes we fly them. So <clears throat> what we have done is we have uh, uh, built a, a chamber uh, and uh, we, we immerse this chamber in a chest freezer. And this gives us the ability to vary both the pressure and the temperature over a wide range. Now, when we typically run an experiment, that's how it looks like. So we generate our particles, we typically dry them, and then we put them on the chest freezer, uh, monitor continuously the humidity and the temperature, and then put the different instruments here that we want to test. 
Now, one of the first instruments that we started working with is the slow cost uh, optical particle counter or spectrometer, because it also gives information about the size distribution of the particles from AlphaSense. Now, the AlphaSense OPC uh, uh, comes with this fan. So if you want to mount it on a UAV and make sure that the flow rate through the OPC is constant, you have to, to, to modify it a bit. And, and it's, this is what we've done in the lab. So basically we, we've taken these OPCs, we removed the fan and uh, adjusted an outlet, uh, which we have connected to a pump and yeah, put some filters to, to protect the pump. Um, and then we, <coughs> we run the system and uh, maintaining the flow rate uh, constant by using a, a critical orifice. And in that way, you can make this, uh, this sensor, this relatively low cost sensor, an operational instrument that you can deploy on board the UAV. Now, some results from these tests, um, how does it perform in terms of counting and sizing? Now, these are uh, still uh, atmospheric conditions. Uh, so the, the setup is not placed in the chamber. And this is the measured size, uh, the measured geometry mean diameter as a function of the nominal size. So what we did is we uh, uh, atomized poly polydispersed uh, polystyrene particles of the fixed size, 800 nanometers, one, uh, one micron and 2.5 microns. And you see, this is the, the, the red one is the, the modified AlphaSense OPC. This is the reference OPC that we have been using, which, which is manufactured by Green. And you see that the agreement is within uh, a reasonable agreement. When uh, we see the 0.8 nanometers, the, uh, the, the one micron, you see that the reference instrument a little bit underestimates that, but this is well known in, in, in the literature for this specific uh, instrument. Now, one other thing that we've done is we um, uh, thought of varying the concentration of the particles uh, and, and see what's the response in terms of the reported mean diameter. And interestingly, you see the reference instrument reports more or less a constant value when we uh, put in uh, 800 nanometer particles. The alpha sense, however, seems to have a, a size a concentration dependence. Now, this concentration dependence, we also see in the um, concentration it reports. This is, uh, again, the concentration of the particles as measured by the reference instrument. And this is the ratio of, this of the two instruments. So you see a size dependence that uh, okay, it starts uh, at, uh, let's say, a relatively low concentration, extremely low concentrations. It over predicts the, uh, uh, the concentration and in, in, uh, in higher concentration, it uh, under predicts. Now, that said, um, if we look at this plus minus 30%, we see that we are in a region where when these are concentrations that we typically find in the atmosphere for the size range that the uh, uh, AlphaSense OPC can measure. So the reported concentration is within agreement with the reference OPC within this plus minus 30%, which is good enough. Now, when you uh, change the temperature uh, and the pressure, so we put these instruments in the, in the chest freezer and drop the temperature from, 20, from room temperature down to minus five, and you see that Oh, this is a reference OPC, and this is the, um, uh, the, the two alpha sense uh, systems that we have. You see that they follow the same trends, which build trust that nothing is happening when, when you expose this system to uh, elevated uh, uh, temperatures that you find at elevated uh, altitudes. Now, I don't show the results here, but the same happens when you drop the pressure down to, uh, if I remember correctly, we, want, we went down to half an atmosphere. And the performance was uh, was good. Okay, um, now there are several instruments that can measure the concentration of particles. Uh, um, there are several OPCs available that one can use with uh, UAVs to measure the concentration of particles. However, when we are interested in the smaller fraction, let's say anything smaller than three or maybe 500 nanometers, we have to go to, uh, to other techniques. Um, and one of the systems that we tested there was the uh, uh, miniaturized handheld CPC offered by TSI, the TSI model 3007. Now the setup is more or less the same with what I've shown you before. The main difference here is that we use the spark discharge to make the particles. Then we use the DMA to size select them before we uh, insert them to the chest freezer. And in the chest freezer, now we have an electrometer and the CPC. 
So by comparing these two, we can determine the um, uh, detection efficiency of the, uh, uh, of the CPC. And these are the, uh, the curves that we get. So this is the detection efficiency as a function of mobility diameter determined by the DMA. And you see that at ambient conditions, 20 degrees C, more or less we get what is expected, uh, what is reported for, from the manufacturer. Um, uh, a cutoff diameter, a D50 diameter of the order of uh, seven to 10 nanometers. Now, if we drop the temperature uh, 10 degrees, you see there's a slight shift. Um, now, if we drop both the temperature and the pressure, uh, the pressure doesn't seem to affect that much. And interestingly, if we see, if we want to increase the temperature, then we see another shift again. So this is, a, um, you know, a, a, a reminder for everyone that is using these type of CPCs with, uh, with UAVs and flies at altitudes uh, above, let's say, a uh, few hundred meters that, okay, if you want to um, um, report these measurements, you definitely have to report also the information about the temperature and the, uh, uh, the pressure, because that's gonna define how the cutoff curves or how the detection efficiency curves change. Now, another system or instrument we have been uh, uh, testing uh, over the last few weeks has been this Spartector from Nanos. For those who are not familiar with the instrument, it uses, um, it's a very miniaturized instrument. So this is uh, a little bit bigger than a pack of cigarettes. Um, and inside here, what you have is a Corona charger. So all the incoming particles are unipolarly charged. There's an ion trap or a precipitator, if you like, that uh, is on and off, is used on and off to kind of do a, a crude sizing of the particles. And then there's a paradecade electrometer. Now the setup we used was very similar. Uh, the generation, uh, particle generation system was the same. Um, the only difference is that in the in this chamber we squeezed all three instruments and we were uh, recording both the counts from uh, from the CPC, the uh, the counts from the electrometer, and the the uh, this particle gives you both the mean size and the concentration of the particles. Now. Uh, <clears throat> these are the nominal sizes that we selected, uh, 40 nanometers, 80 nanometers, 106 and 100 nanometers. And you see this, the counting error, uh, sorry, this is a typo that should be error. Um, when we compare the, uh, the counts that the uh, particle gives compared to the CPC or the electrometer, which agree quite well at this size. Uh, and what you see is that, okay, for the smaller particles, the deviation is a little bit higher. And then as you get a little bit bigger then this, this deviation is smaller, it makes sense because the charging efficiency of, uh, uh, of the particles increases as the particle size uh, uh, increases. Now, one thing with uh, instruments using electrometers is the concentration. So in order to check if um, we use here something like 5,000 particles per cubic centimeter. So to check if, uh, um, uh, the system behaves well at different concentration, we, we, we simply test it 2,000 and 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter, and you see that more or less the picture is, is the same. Now, again, if we use this plus minus 30% uncertainty, uh, we see that uh, this instrument reports the, uh, the concentration of, of the aerosol within this limit, so it's, it's a good system to use. Now, mind, this is at ambient conditions still, huh? Now, the same we could say about the size. The sizing uh, accuracy is again within, easily within plus minus 30%. And that's uh, by comparing the size reported by the, uh, by the uh, protector and the size that we size select with the DMA. Now, unfortunately, when we expose this system at lower temperatures, then things change substantially. So you see here, this is room temperature, and then this is what's happening to the size, the, uh, the sizing error. There is a trend. We're still within, let's say, the 35 or uh, 35, or minus 30 or minus 35 percent error. But this trend is, is something to worry about. Now, what's even more worrying is the counting error uh, that you see again in increases as, uh, as the uh, uh, temperature drops and uh, we can reach values up to uh, 50%. Um, 
things are even a little bit uh, uh, worse uh, when you see the, the dependence on pressure. Again, you see the same threads. You see an under prediction on, uh, on the sizing as we decrease the pressure from one to 0.7 atmosphere and an increase in the counting error uh, when uh, we, we change the pressure by the same amount. One minute remaining. Okay. So um, I guess that's something that I presented to you um, um, last time. Uh, we are busy with uh, developing an instrument, uh, DMA, using 3D printing. Um, the system appears to behave uh, uh, well. Actually, we're thinking that as the next step, instead of using the sizing of the part actor, uh, to start using a DMA to do the sizing uh, on board the UAVs. Um, and uh, most recently, I mean, once you start, uh, you buy a 3D printer in, in your lab and then uh, all the students are excited. Um, we recently had this uh, go and trying to, to see if we can even print the 3D, the, print the, the, the flow laminarizers or the flow straighteners. Now, for those who are familiar with the DMAs, um, uh, for the sheet flow, at the, at the inlet of the sheet flow, the DMAs use this background flow straightener. So what uh, uh, Haris, one of uh, my PhD students tried was to 3D print a flow laminarizer or flow straightener. That's what he developed. Um, and you see now the, the, the laminarizer is much thicker and it has more layers than the Dacron mesh that has only two layers. Um, in order to test it, we run a, a typical tandem DMA system. Uh, so we size select the particles using the first DMA and then use the second DMA with the flow laminarizer change to measure the difference in, in resolution. And this is the results you get. So this is resolution as a function of the sheet flow. At low sheet flows, more or less well, every, every laminarizer catches the, uh, the theoretical uh, prediction, the theoretical calculation. Um, if you go above a certain value, then uh, the 3D printed is uh, uh, definitely much, much better. And the same goes for the transfer function height. Okay, um, some quick take home messages. Um, I mean, to measure uh, large particles, let's say above 300 nanometers, you can easily do that with, uh, with low cost and miniaturized OPCs. That's not a problem. You only have to simply modify them. To, measure, to, to make sure that the flow rate is constant. Um, if you want to measure the concentration again, uh, down to 10 nanometers, again, you can use CPCs. Um, you have to be a little bit careful with the conditions uh, that you expose the instrument to. And last uh, message is that if you want to determine the size of the small particles, the sub 300 nanometers, then there we need more effort. We, we need to build something that will report the size of these instruments uh, at low pressures and temperatures with higher accuracy. And thank you all for your attention. Thanks so much, Judge, I appreciate it. We have time for one question. So um, we're gonna try again to see if the, the raise hand function is available for people. I know that might be harder to find. Um, and if you're unable to find it, please leave questions in the, the chat for the, um, for the overall conference. So I'll give you guys a second to try to find that raise hand function if there are any questions out there. All right, um, I'm not seeing any, so if, if I've missed you, I apologize. Um, and, and hopefully George will be able to answer some questions on the group chat. So thank you so much, George. Sure, yeah. So our next speaker is